First of all, I want everybody of you here in Bailan congratulate on bringing such a great group together and making a, a new center. And I'm looking forward to work together with uh, many of you. And we started yesterday already, you know, so that I have some new things to talk about the next time I come, if I solve the problems. And, you know, Marin is laughing because she's, she was happy about the things we came out yes, about yesterday. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, 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 you have to speak about it, yes. So, so you, can, you can hear about these things in her poster if you want, but I'm not gonna talk about these things here because it's... it's so uh, I will try to give you an overview of some of the experiments we did or some of the things that, that we started that interested us in, in the question, uh, if a completely isolated system relaxes or how do quantum systems relax? Uh, why is it interesting? Do someone have a point or something? So why is it in interesting? I think, you know, non-equilibrium physics is at the heart of many of the most interesting physics problems. And uh, if you start from the very big, you know, inflation, things that happen after inflation or in, in, the, in the very early cosmology uh, started started, uh, you know, and non-equilibrium processes, or if you wanna uh, ask another very fundamental question, you know, uh, how does you go from a classical world to the, how does you go from the quantum world to the classical world is also one of those non-equilibrium processes. And, uh, you know, if you ever wanna build a quantum computer, every computing device is something that's extremely far off equilibrium, and uh, you wanna have to keep it there, you know, interested. So, I mean, I think, you know, looking at it, at non-equilibrium systems, I think is an interesting, very interesting question. It's also somewhere we don't know very little, we know very little about those types of things. Now, the basic idea for many of our experiments was the following. Uh, first of all, I thought, okay, the really interesting problems are the ones where the system is completely isolated because, you know, if I have something where I have an environment and I say, okay, this is coupled to environment and all the information goes in there. I can always draw a much longer, much larger boundary around it and it can always include everything around it. So I think the real question is the one of an isolated system. And so you, you start with something that sits in, let's talk in thermal equilibrium or whatever, in some initial state and it's isolated, it's many body system, it's interacting and then one thing you can do is you can change its Hamiltonian from H0 to H1, basically instantaneously. You know, the wave function stays the same. You start, but this is not an eigen, or this wave function here, you could say, okay, this is a superposition of many eigenfunctions of H0. Here, this one, you know, is a completely different superposition of H1. And uh, that will, you know, start some time evolution of, your wave function. Now the question is that what happens there? You could say uh, every physics is unitary, quantum physics is unitary, there will be some evolution, there will be no relaxation. And then you could say, okay, maybe, you know, there's some kind of relaxation within the system and it goes to some new equilibrium, let's call it thermal equilibrium. And, you know, could be, you know, various different types of, whereas it could be quasi steady states in between and, and whatsoever. And, uh, I think one of the nice systems to study these things, if you look at, you, you know, to study these things, you want to look at something that is complex enough so that it shows the physics, but it's simple enough so they can have a chance of understanding it. And I think one dimensional Bose gases are an, a nice system because they can be very easily isolated from their surroundings. Yeah, they are very well controllable and they allow you to probe these things. So I will tell you in my talk, First about a little bit about the system that we study, what's a coherently split 1D quantum gas and how to probe it. Because when we studied these things, uh, you know, the problem was we had experimental data and had no clue how to interpret them. And then, uh, you know, at one of those conferences, which was not long ago, probably 12 years ago or something, you know, Eugene was sitting in there and I said, hey, you know, you can look to use this and this and this and this methods and that's how we started collaborating on, on finding out ways how to really analyze these many body systems in a non-equilibrium evolution. And I will give an example of how does 
a coherently split one D quantum gas approaches an equilibrium state that we think about pre thermalization, the light cone like spreading of, you know, the final correlation factor of, of decoherence, a generalized Gibbs ensemble, and, and then I will talk about something that we put in archive a few weeks ago, how to see quantum recurrences of long range order for a system of thousands of particles. And in the end, I will say a little bit about something. What information is in, this, in the measurements that we do, and how do we get it out, and what do we learn from correlation functions? And I think that's the starting point, I think, of a completely new way of looking at many body physics, where you can really probably, you know, from really quantify what the information we can get out of the system. And there is uh, lots and lots of theory, theoretical problems that are open there, which we can look at. Now, uh, let's say, how do we create a non-equilibrium state? First of all, the system we look at is a one-dimensional system. And what is, it, what is a one-dimensional system? Of course, we live in the 3D world. We have to build a one-dimensional system. How do we build it? By confining the system very tightly in two spatial directions and have one other direction very weakly confined. And the confinement in, two, in the two spatial directions, transverse spatial directions, is so tight that interaction energy and temperature is much smaller than this, this uh, excitation energy, so that basically the first transverse excited state is empty. Yeah? So that you can really completely freeze it out. Of course, you know, being in the 3D world, it renormalizes quantities in the 1D system. But nevertheless, you know, this, with these renormalized quantities, we can do our physics. Then you can describe, if you have bosons in there, you can describe the field the bosonic field in there by, you know, a fluctuating phase and a fluctuating density. And usually at some, you know, if you prepare your system, you know, you hope that this fluctuating phase and fluctuating temperature are thermally populated. What's also very nice is that this fluctuating phase is directly accessible in interference experiments. In an all our interference experiments, this fluctuating phase will be the quantity that we look at and it's directly accessible interference. And what's also nice in 1D is that there are a huge range of theoretical models. Of course, in principle, there's a Lieb linear exactly solvable integrable model. But you know, usually what you have, you have a very complicated quantum field theory. What you usually do, you make a low energy effective approximation, which is simpler, which captures the essence of the physics. And for the 1D system, that's a latential liquid, which is a bunch of harmonic oscillators. And to free theory with a bunch of harmonic oscillators where the density and the phase are the two quadrature components of the oscillator. Like with having, now you can do quantum optics with these excitations in the latential liquid in the same way as you do with quantum optics with the photons of the electromagnetic field, except that you have phase and density uh, as your quadrature components. And then if you take two of those latential liquids, you couple them together, and uh, you, know, you follow the ideas of Larry Gritsev and and uh, Volva Gritsev and Eugene Demla and Polkovnikov, you can show that there's two uh, coupled uh, latential liquid, two coupled latential liquids uh, can be described by the quantum sine Gordon model, which has an additional term in there where the cosine of the relative phase field enters. So this is a non-Gaussian term, a non-trivial term, which leads to topological excitations and you know excitations with a mass and and whatever. In that, and this is a and a model that you know can be mapped to many under fundamental field theory models. If you talk to field theorists, they say this is a much more interesting model than the bose hubbard model. It's a much more rich model than the bose hubbard model. So basically, if that's from these one-dimensional systems, we can just build these things and probe them. And there are you know, full libraries full of theoretical calculations how to, how to treat these, these things. Most of them are in equilibrium, of course. Very few is done in non-equilibrium. How do we? Now, create a non-equilibrium system. We take, we start with one one-dimensional gas, which is fluctuating density and fluctuating phase, and then we do a quench, and the quench is we instantaneously split it. Now, we do it instantaneously because we want that during the splitting process, the interactions that are in the system you can neglect. Then the splitting pose is nothing else like a beam splitter in classical quantum optics. When you do this classic quantum optics, what does the beam splitter do? It makes as good as a copy that quantum mechanics allows you 
to make the two things. They're as good as corpuses they are. So they have gonna have the same phase, but they're gonna have fluctuations in the number. Now these fluctuations in the number, yeah, I can, you know, all of these two things, you know, if this system was non-interacting, nothing would happen afterwards. Because it's fluctuations in the number, everything it would propagate whatever it wants in time, time and nothing would happen. Now, if the system is interacting, so these fluctuations in number mean that locally the energy is different in these two systems. And then locally, they would mean that basically the evolu that an evolution starts because locally the wave function evolves differently with different energy. Now, you can either write down this as, you know, the gas one with fluctuating density n1 and phase one or n2 and phase two, or you can basically make a symmetric or the antisymmetric combination of that. And when you make the symmetric antisymmetric combination of that, you find that the symmetric combination contains all the original fluctuations. And the antisymmetric combination contains only the quantum fluctuations that come from the quench. Now, this works only in the 1D system because the antisymmetric mode is usually related in splitting to the first excited state. Now, if the first excited state would have been populated, this antisymmetric state would be populated by quantum fluctuations plus everything that's there. Now, because I'm in so cold that I, the, the first excited state is completely empty, and it's empty by the e to the minus 10 or e to the minus 20 in our experiments, yeah? I basically have the chance of doing, if I look at antisymmetric mode, I do an experiment in a many body system whose initial state I look at had temperature t equals zero. I don't know any other way how to do that, yeah? Because usually you're always limited by the temperature you do, yeah? So basically what you see, what you, every population would see in antisymmetric mode, it's a real fundamental quantum noise that comes from the quench. And now you can ask the question, let's keep it and wait time, and will it ever reach a thermal equilibrium? Now what would be thermal equilibrium? Thermal equilibrium would be symmetric and antisymmetric mode to be equally thermally populated. Yeah? And so this is the question I can ask. Or, you know, how does this evolution work? Does it go to a thermal equilibrium? Does it go to other states in between? And I can look at it, you know, basically, by looking at this antisymmetric state, does it go from here down to here? I think gives you a nice probe into doing that. And also, it's beautiful in our experiments. We can really see what are the initial states, what are the final states, and I'll show you how you would see them directly in this interference patterns. So you can do both of those states in the following way. You take one system and split it. So how do you do that? You take a, now this is a, a transverse cut through this, this trap. So it's transverse, you know, you have a thermal gas, you cool it to, to, into the, the condensate, into the ground state, in the transverse ground state, and then you split. This is splitting a condensate, splitting a 1D system, or I take a thermal gas, split that, and cool. And then I produce two, two classically separated identities, which are two classically separated objects, you know, each of them being a condensate, and the symmetric and antisymmetric mode are thermally populated. So we would expect to go from here to here, that would be the transition of thermalization. Or the transition from having something that's very strongly quantum connected to something that's classically separated, transition from a quantum world to the classical world, at least in some observables. Now, how you do that, if you do that, you know, you take the system, you create the, the two elongated condensates, you know, you switch off the trap, and these two things fall down in gravity, and because they are very tightly confined in this direction, Heisenberg just lets them expand, they start overlapping like in a double slit experiment, and you measure the interference pattern. If I take the one thing where I just basically split, I see very straight, uh, straight interference fringes. Basically means that there's as good as, as it gets a copy. And I have these dark, these dark lines that go down there. What are these dark lines that go down there? If this is very strongly fluctuating phase, I should get a speckle pattern. A speckle pattern in 1D are dark lines. Yeah? So it tells you that I have something that's very strongly phase fluctuating. These are the speckles, but its relative phase is, you know, perfect. If I make the two classical separated 1D systems, 
You know, of course, I have an, an order parameter here. I have an order parameter here. Locally, I will see interference, but its fringes will, you know, will be very wiggly, because and if I make an ensemble average here, all of the things will line up. If you make an ensemble average here, you just get a Gaussian. Yeah, so G1 is basically zero here. You can see that the best by just looking at the distribution of the phase. This is a very narrow distribution of the phase. Here it's a completely flat distribution of the phase. So I have, you know, in my experiment directly, you know, I can directly see what is happening in this non-equilibrium evolution. Now, of course, you know, there's these nice pictures. There's some, you need to have some tools of analyzing them. So you take a picture like that. This is a typical interference pattern of a few thousand atoms. Now you can take each slice here, you take one slice, and you take that interference pattern, and you can fit the interference pattern and extract the phase difference between the two gases, and you can extract the amplitude of this interference pattern. Now, out of such an interference pattern, I can reconstruct either a correlation function. Now, because this is a uh, system that has a finite size, usually extract the non-translation variant correlation function. So basically, you have about you know, 35 to 40 points where you evaluate the phase. And then you take the phase here and you co co construct the correlation function Z of Z1, Z2. The, and you would put the correlation between this phase and this phase here. Of course, the autocorrelation is 1, you know, if Z1 equals Z2. And so you can reconstruct the correlation function. And that would have, you know, this would be a square, something like, you know, 35 to 40 squared entries. The second thing you can do, you can plot the phase and amplitude of this interference pattern in a polar plot. And from that, you can plot now the ensemble average. You can put the full distribution function of amplitude and phase. And, you know, correlation functions and full distribution functions have basically the same information. In some things, it's easier to get information out of the correlation function. In other things, it's easier to get out the information of the full distribution functions. As a solid state physicist, you would say full distribution functions, for example, if you want to measure full counting statistics. Yeah? How these things are related, there are beautiful papers by, uh, by Anatoly Prokofnikov and Kritzev and, and Demler and, and Altman and others, where they basically related that and where we showed that this thing can be applied into the part. So in, in, the, in the later on my talk now, I basically will show you either full distribution functions. They, are, they might be you know, just the phase, or it would be full distribution function of the phase, or maybe may phase and amplitude, or on, only amplitude. Yeah. So these are these type of things. Or I will show you correlation functions. Yeah. So good. How do we do that? So first, how, how, how do we do the experiments? We do these experiments on, you know, if you do statistical physics, uh, you want to be sure that these experiments are extremely reproducible. So we do that on, an, on a chip. And uh, yeah, it helps you to make these very elongated 1D systems and that they are very, very cold. And it also has a, a nice way of making double well potential in an extremely controlled way that uh, you can split this in extremely controlled way and make these interference patterns. Now, the typical experimental procedure is, as I said, initial gas, splitting, straight fringes, and then you wait after some time. So this is basically long range order. The phase has the relative phase is long range order. This starts to be fluctuating. The fringes become wiggly. You know, you take you you can integrate over a certain length scale here, and you see how you know, how strong the contrast and the phase is. And integrating the length scale, you know, an interaction of this contrast gives you some kind of hint of how wiggly these fringes are. And these are, you know, we can reconstruct full distribution functions or phase correlation functions out of that. And you can also measure what the thermal equilibrium is there. Now let's look. This is something like a plot where this whole thing started very long ago because we had no clue how else to understand that. If you take an integra in integrate your interference over the whole length of your 1D system, I just plot the square of the contrast. It tells you what's happening. First, you have a very fast decrease of contrast to something, some mean value of the contrast, and then a very slow further decrease here. Now, what was puzzling in the beginning of us was, 
you could calculate it from the temperature, what, how fast that should go down, and it should have gone down to here. Yeah? And it took us something like, you know, six years to find the methods to understand what this is. But if you look at the full distribution functions, for example, of exactly that thing, you find this is now, remember, full distribution functions of phase and contrast. And you look at it, you know, integrate the interference pattern of different length scales. What do you find? Somewhere here, you know, the system splits. And then you see that the phase becomes random. It dephases. But for very short length scales, the contrast stays constant. For very long length scales, the contrast just goes down to a blob. How can we understand that? And that, you know, how to understand that? It goes back to, to uh, Takuya Kitagawa, one of you know, Eugene's students in Harvard, who you know, calculated the whole system in, a, in a lattice liquid theory. And in principle, you know, after you've understood it, it's a, it's a simple way to understand it. You know, if you look at very short length scales, this quench to puts energy in there, has only, there's only very small occupation in phonons that have wavelengths that are shorter than these length scales that are integrate. It basically means these phonons that are in there just uniformly shift the phase, but the phase is not weakly within my integration length. Therefore, I should just see spin diffusion. I should just see diffusion and it should get start up to become these nice rings. If at very long length scales, I have many, many, many phonons that have wavelengths that are shorter the time that I look at. Therefore, the fringes become wiggly within the thing and the contrast goes down. Yeah? So basically, uh, these ways of what energy you put in the system and what the wavelengths of the phonons are that you put in the system and how uh, you know, they deface describes in a very nicely qualitative way. See? But by the way, the you know, split 1D system can be seen as a spin chain, or uh, physics is basically the same for many of these, these things. Now, you go there and now compare over all length scales that you measure and uh, times. And this is now you know, theory experiment without any, any free parameter. And of course, the theory has the advantage that you know, they can calculate thousands of realizations, whereas in an experiment, you can do a few hundred, and the statistics is a little bit worse. You know, you see the greatness. But what's nice is that you see is that there's a form of defacing. It looks like there's a steady state that emerges here. And there's some kind of a crossover between the two regimes. There's an effective new length scale which emerges somewhere in between there, which separates the, you know, the spin diffusion from the spin decay or you know, magnetization diffusion or magnetization decay regime of the system. Now, there's an uh, interpretation of that. As I said, our 1D system is very close to an integrable system. If it's not a perfectly integrable system, but it's very close to an integrable system. Yeah? So the fast evolution is the defacing of the phonons. And also, the, it, what we dis it's described with you know, the Latin liquids in integrable theory. Yeah? So th what we see is basically quote, quote, realization in something like how an integrable system would relax or for a specific observable. The quasi steady state is a quantum state that this integral relaxes to, and it, it should be described by a generalized Gibbs ensemble, and then we'll come back to that. The quasi steady state is determined by the conserved quantities of this one, this lattice liquid, which are these phonons. The fast splitting process leads to equipartition of energy in all these modes, and therefore you should get a thermal like state. And, and this temperature should be related to the energy that I put in there. You can calculate that it should be temperatures given by the coupling constant times density, yeah, over two. And this is something, uh, and also because it's an, you should you know, expect revivals of if these phonons rephase at log times, you know, somehow if a very long time, you know, this integrability should be broken, should relax or something like that. And that's uh, an example of these pre thermalized states that was predicted for uh, heavy ion collisions in high energy physics. In the, from quantum, non-equilibrium quantum field theory in 2004. Now, of course, you can go and check that. Because this full distribution function allows you to get, extract the temperature. And what you see is that the you know, temperature is linear proportional to the density if you measure. And it's completely in proportional to the initial temperature. Yeah? 
which really nicely verifies this uh, thing. Good. So it relaxes to this pre-thermalized state. The question is that we can look at it. How does this initial evolution happen? So the question that we ask is that, OK, I have a thermal-like correlation function here, initial state here. You know, how, do you, how does the thermal-like correlation function emerge in the system like that? So in the beginning of long-range order, then you have an exponential correlation functions. How does it go? Does this just simply emerge locally? And for that, we look at the time evolution of the phase correlation function, either the i phi z, 1 minus z, 2. And when you do that, you see, you know, first in the beginning is long-range order. As long as it goes down, we see it decays and stays flat, decays and stays flat. And so you can look at that and can plot this now, including your at, at lattice liquid theory, including the, your resolution. You see that the final correlation function, which is this one, locally emerges immediately after the quench and spreads out with an horizon to the system. Yeah? So you have a horizon where outside you have long range order, inside you have uh, the final correlation function. Now you can go, go that and just take, you know, take this model and extrapolate the long range order back to the, to the initial correlation function to find really a linear uh, intersection point. And you can measure you know, the steepness of that and you find that it's exactly the uh, sound velocity of my system. And it's nice in that sense because, you know, lattice liquid is a theory with a linear dispersion relation, so it looks like a relativistic theory, and the, the, the spreading of information there, which corresponds to the speed of light in our, you know, in our in electromagnetism is the phonon speed in this system. And, uh, of course, this was predicted before. It's predicted by Calabrese and Cardi for 2000, 2006 where they wrote this down general for, for, uh, for conformal quantum field theories, that that information spread should be given by these excitations. And our experience basically, this was then later on also calculated for lattice models by, by Kama and others. And then since then, there are many, many different other models of that. So we have a light cone like spreading of the evolution. We have the pre thermalized state. And now this look, what's the quantum state that the system relaxes to? And if you have a, an, a system with many, many conserved quantities, there's a beautiful paper by Jaynes in the, in the end of the 50s who basically said that, OK, if a system is completely isolated but has many more conserved quantities than energy, you know, the density matrix should, look, should, should reflect that. And it should be Lagrange multiplier for every conserved quantity. And he termed an, you know, a system like that you know, in a larger to the Gibbs ensemble, a generalized Gibbs ensemble, which would reflect the conserved quantities. So in our case, Sometimes people say it's a temperature for everything. I don't really like it. It's just some Lagrange multiplier temperature should only be related to the energy, I think. Yeah? So, and for us, these, these conserved quantities are the phonon modes. Now, to do that type of experiment, you want to have that, you know, studying with equipartition is not such a good idea because you want to you wanna basically, to show that this is a really interesting density matrix and, and general Gibbs ensemble, you want to have different non thermal occupation numbers in the, in the different states. And how do we do that? We can basically, you know, we use these correlation functions to look at the system. And if we take our simple experiment with a light cone, which was infinitely fast splitting and light cone, then you see that the, there's this correlation function, you see the autocorrelation coming out in the long range order, this plateau which goes down. Now, if I make my splitting not, ex not infinitely fast, but make it slower, we suddenly find very strange correlation functions. Now, what does this correlation function mean? It means that, you know, remember the light cone was this thing that went down. That means that in the anti-diagonal, to for x equals minus x, x1 equals minus x2, there are enhanced correlations. So I see enhanced correlations outside the light cone. Yeah? Which would mean that you know there is enhanced, there's something that knows that one side of the universe knows something about, about the other side of the universe. This has to be imprinted in the initial state. Now, you can make an extremely simple model 
and say, okay, maybe I have two temperatures for the symmetric and in, for the even in the odd phonon modes, then you get close to there. But in principle, is you can go and take this correlation function and try to calculate out of this, this final relaxed correlation function the density matrix, which means the occupation of the phonons. And if you do that, you know, and take one, oh, sorry. You can take, if you do that, and take, you know, one phonon, two, three, four, and they do that, and you see that there's up to, up to about, you know, it's statistically significant to up to about seven or eight phonon modes, and it converges to a nice distribution, and you see that many of these phonons are very weakly occupied, and some of them very strongly occupied, and these are the even ones are strongly occupied. So, so the, the model that there's different, different temperatures for even and odd phonons was not so bad, but also what's interesting is that this is the quantum noise. So basically we create phonons that are very strongly squeezed, and some of them are strongly anti-squeezed. Yeah? I'm sure there will be many classic papers to have that in the title, but it's in our figure caption. Yeah? So we, we wrote it in there that it can really, you know, basically these are, these are squeezed phonon modes that you can create in this non-equilibrium evolution. And so this is, uh, that this is really a generalized Gibbs ensemble, you should be able to, you know, the density matrix should describe, you know, many, you know, just only the averages are not good enough to describe, to, to show that this is so. We evaluated the four point, six point, and 10 point functions, and then took our density matrix, the GE density, density matrix, and calculated out of that the four point, six point, and 10 point functions, and, you know, up to 10 point functions, you know, the density matrix describes in a nice way that, so that I think that's, We've really shown that this system relaxes to something like a general skips or something. Now, what happens afterwards? And for that, I want to tell you something that we just put in the archive. Is that recurrences? Uh, so we're looking at you know, does this coherence that goes down to the to the dense, to the classical density matrix just goes up again? So of course, there, you know, when do recurrences happen? There's this old thing for you know. That any finite physical system will return up really close to its initial state in course of its dynamics. You know, very soon this was you know taken up and said, you know, Poincare recurrences can also be transferred to quantum to the quantum domain. There are two, two nice papers. And then uh, you can ask yourself, and of course, you know, in quantum the, the revivals, collapse and revivals the James Cummings model as a nice example how this would happen in an, in a quantum system. And they, are, they were predicted very soon after this idea that to take Poincaré recurrences into the quantum domain. And uh, there were beautiful experiments, you know, from Rempis 1, but there are many, many different other ones. So uh, now in a many body system, Poincaré said each state goes back to its initial state. Now, we cannot observe a many body eigenstate. We can only observe, the things we can observe are few body observables. So if I want to observe, we make much simpler experiments. We cannot observe that, you know, it's exponentially difficult to observe the many body eigenstate of thousands of particles. Yeah? There's much simpler measurements. We would make local few body observables. So I think if you want to look for recurrences in the many body system, you know, under which, it's posed the question, under which conditions can I observe recurrences under these observables that I have? Yeah? I don't really care if the complete state comes back. I only care if the state under this observable that I have comes back. And uh, so the system does not have to come back close to the initial configuration. In many body states, only need to satisfy the condition that gives a similar result on observable O. And in quantum model, the system such observables O usually reflect uh, you know, the collective degrees of freedom of the underlying quantum field theory. So, you know, this dramatically reduces the complexity of the problem to the, you know, basically to the number of occupied, occupied modes or, or other things like that. And if I now design them in the correct way, you know, if I made, for example, the frequency of these collective modes commensurate, then I should be able to see these recurrences in a very large system. How do we do that? This is, you know, if we do the experiment in a harmonic trap, we only, up to now, only looked at the, you know, this is the, the correlation function. 
that are plotted, and so long range order is everything is red, and this is the exponential correlation function after the decay. Now, if I took a system in a box, it would come back after some time. It would go down. If I put the system in a harmonic oscillator, it goes away because they, they, the phonon frequencies are non commensurate. So you can do a very simple system, as I said, in a box, it should come back. The harmonic oscillator, it should not come back. Now, the cheap way of making an harmonic at box is just putting hard walls in an harmonic oscillator. And if you do that, and this is now exactly a measured correlation function, this would be the light cone dynamics, this would be the GGE, and it comes back, and it goes away. Yeah? Now we can look at it more carefully, you know, take something like that, and then you know, in the beginning, you have the long range order. Here, you have the exponential correlation function. Here, long range order comes back. Exponential correlation function, long range order comes back. Of course, it doesn't come back perfectly. So in this observable, we see recurrences of a long range order of a system with about 5,000 particles and about 50 occupied moles. Yeah? And it's in a system where in the original Hamiltonian, the interaction energy is the largest quantity. Yeah? So it's not something, interaction is not something small. Interaction energy is the largest quantity. It's larger than temperature, much larger than temperature, and everything else. Now, and also, you can say, does the, does the G, you know, does average cosine phi, which is basically the, 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 the ensemble averaged coherence come back? No. It goes away. It tells you nicely, it depends on which observable I use. Yeah? Also, these correlation functions are nice because, you know, overall fluctuations drop out. I measure phase differences. Here, I average over all the things, all the, all the imperfection of the experiment. Here, it just basically goes away, never comes back. The long range order comes back. And you can measure that and you can calculate them how they are. It comes back in a nice way. The next thing I want to, to look at is that, you know, how do these uh, recurrences you know, go away? Of course, you would expect from the lat you can calculate what would be if it's a perfect lattice liquid. And it would you know, deface a little bit because you know, variations of the initial conditions and things like that. But if you measure, depending on the effective temperature of the system, you see that the, the, the recurrence height goes down. But if you take a classical fields calculation, which basically takes into account the interactions between the phonons, I think it describes it in a nice way. So that's basically a system that where you see that there is relaxation. There is real relaxation in the 1D system and in a very, very cold 1D system. It's not through the excitations to the transverse excited states. And it's a breakdown of latential liquid theory for the phonons. So I think this is, gives you a completely new view into the physics of these type of systems. Yeah. So uh, what did we see? I think the defacing of the many body eigenstates leads to you know, a classical density matrix that usually described by general Skips ensemble. You know, if my few body observer reflects a, a conserved quantity of the system, then relaxation leads to these pre-thermalized states. And I think the complexity of these large quantum systems leads to emergence of these classical properties. So you could maybe take you know, this nice old drawing and just say you know, this border is the defacing of the many body states. Now, how, how I'm doing? I can stop here, or I can tell you something about high order correlation functions. Maybe I just to be you know, extremely quick. The question that there is, is that I want to ask is, what can we get out of a many body system? So what we usually do is we measure pictures. And what you do, what well, the best thing you can do, you can measure pictures that where every single atom is in there. And you know, there is, you know, this is our way of doing it. It basically, you know, every dot is a single atom that you see. And this is in time of flight, and it's basically a measure of the momentum. Or, you know, if you publish it in a glossy journal, you can, you know, you can, you know, this is the experiments from Markus Kreina, where you, they count every single atom, you know, localized in the lattice, but basically, you know, with the same detection efficiency, same thing in there. What this is, is these measurements are basically single short realizations of an endpoint function. And the question is that what information is in an endpoint function? 
Yeah? So uh, we did an experiment on that by using a non-trivial field theory, which is this coupled model, this sine gordon model. And in that, you basically can ask yourself, OK, if I have a correlation function, an endpoint function with coordinate z, which is basically you take some operator, oh, you measured z1, another operator measured coordinate z2 and zn, you know? What information is in there? You look at statistics books, can tell you this correlation function, you can, you can decompose in the disconnected part and the connected part. The disconnected part in order n is fully determined by all other lower order correlation functions, whereas the connected part contains a new function. So if you want to know if there is new information in higher correlations, then you have to be able to calculate the disconnected and the connected part. And if the statistic is Gaussian, of course, everything is connected in a second order correlation function. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to calculate this, but of course, you can measure these things. And if, you know, in the, in the St. Gordon model, if the term that's connected, this cosine term, if that's ir irrelevant, I have a quadratic theory, and the correlation functions factorize. If the term is, is relevant, this connected part stays. And if the, if the, the, cosine, the, the term in front of the uh, cosine is extremely large, you can approximate the cosine with the quadratic theory, it again becomes irrelevant. So it gives you insight into these things. And so what, you know, you can, we can measure this, you know, up to 10th order. Yeah? We can measure this up to 10th order. And what does it tell you? This connected part of the correlation functions tell you the following. They are connected to the so-called sum of all connected diagrams in the diagrammatic approach of solving the quantum field theory. And so the four-point function would be the sum of all terms which are, have, they have four legs here, which I cannot cut apart in lower orders. The six-point function would be the one that I cannot, this would be all interactions that cannot be done in, you know, in propagation or in, in two-part interactions in eight and ten. So basically it would mean that even though my original Hamiltonian only has two-point interactions in there, in my experiment, I see genuine five-point interactions, which are the genuine quantum corrections come the quantum field theory. And I think this is the way to analyze these many-body systems in the, in the future. And you know, I think you know, there's lots and lots of stuff to be done. And uh, let me stop here, because I could talk about two hours about these things. And uh, I gave a, you know, I talked in Emanuele's course, I gave a lecture on that. So you can ask the students who were in there. <laughs> and by the way, there's a poster by Thomas, who did all these experiments. He knows much more about how to do that. And there's a poster, and you can look up there, and he can tell you everything you want. So uh, yes, maybe at the end. I think what I'm interested in is, is, is are there some universal quantities in, non, in this non-equilibrium evolution? And is there something maybe that we, that, you know, like phase transitions, we know we have a you know, classification of all these different types of, of things that happen. Can we do the same thing for non-equilibrium evolution? And uh, I think there are hints in there that something that has, which is, I think, the most striking one is this plot, which tells you that, a univer that the universal scaling function for a scalar BC and for, for QCD is the same. Don't ask me why in non-equilibrium evolution. Yeah? Don't ask me why. Yeah? And that's striking. Or? That for QCD and a scalar BC, a scaling, the scaling function that rescales in non-equilibrium evolution is exactly the same. Don't ask me why. Yeah? And so it would be fun to find out that. And so we need lots and lots of experiments and lots and lots of different systems. And you know. Uh, so I think I should give you that, you know, what have we learned about the system? I think this, this correlation function and full distribution functions are a cool way of looking at it. And uh, I also think that what I showed you, the way how a system relaxes is very general. For a quantum field theory, if your system is described by quantum field theory with relatively long-lived excitations, this is what you will see, what I showed you. And that might be one of those 
universality classes of this non-equilibrium evolution. Yeah? And also, you know, it depends very strongly on which observables that you use and what you see in these metabolic systems. Yes, so thanks. Of course, I didn't do the work. Many of the, two of them, two of my guys are here. Marin sits back there. And Thomas probably still on the beach because he decided to stay on an Airbnb close to the beach. And <laughs> since, he, since it took him a, an hour and a half yesterday morning and he knows my talk, he decided to come a little bit later, <laughs> which I completely understand. And if somebody wants to come and work with us, give me a call. You know? Or I talk to Marino or somebody else, you know, he can tell you what we do. <laughs>